I'm Susan McGuire, Manager of Professional Development at ACCE, and I'm happy to welcome you to the first of our new series on 2015 Chamber of the Year Award winners. We are so happy that you have joined us for this series in which we'll hear and learn from each of the chambers that won 2015 Chamber of the Year Awards, achieving excellence in leading businesses and helping communities prosper. In this kickoff webinar, Ed Rodriguez, President and CEO of the Coastal Alabama Business Chamber, winner of the 2015 Category 2 Chamber of the Year Award, will describe how the Chamber rebranded itself for the first time since its formation decades ago. Before I turn the program over to Ed, we have a few housekeeping notes. Um, first, we will have a few minutes for questions at the end of the webinar. If you have any questions, please ask them using the question function of the webinar. The question box is on the lower right-hand corner of your screen. Just type in your question, and I'll read the question to end at the end of his presentation. Uh, if we run out of time and we don't get to your question, or if you have an individual question that would be better asked, um, answered individually offline, um, we can get in touch with you directly after the webinar to answer it. Um, Ed also has his contact information up here on the screen, and he can, you can get in touch with him directly if you'd prefer. Um, and second, this webinar is being recorded and should be up on the ACC website on the ACC University webinar page within the next few days. We'll also have Ed's presentation materials available download to, for download as well. So please look for those on our website within the next few days. So with that, I'd like to introduce our speaker today. Uh, Ed Rodriguez has been the President and CEO of the Coastal Alabama Business Chamber since 2011 but his chamber career began when he was only 17. A high school work project with the Coral Gables Chamber of Commerce in Florida eventually led to a graduate student internship with the Florida Chamber of Commerce and his master's research on chamber management. Before joining the Coastal Alabama Business Chamber, he was president and CEO of the Robbins Regional Chamber of Commerce, a regional chamber serving several counties and cities in middle Georgia. Ed led the Robbins Chamber to its first five-star accreditation with that chamber being the only one in middle Georgia to hold that status. In the 1990s and early 2000s, uh, Ed was founding partner in a firm that specialized in fundraising and development for chambers throughout the U.S. Earlier, he had served as CEO of the Amelia Island Chamber in his hometown of Fernandina Beach, and he was membership executive for the Daytona Beach Chamber and a communications executive for the Greater Miami Chamber. He's a graduate of the U.S. Chambers Institute for Organization Management and has led numerous workshops and seminars for chamber professionals sponsored by chamber associations across the country. He's a past board member of the Florida Chamber of Commerce Executives and the Florida Association of Membership Executives. A Florida native, Ed earned his bachelor's degree from Florida Southern College and his master's degree from Florida State University. Just a little bit about the Chamber of the Year award that the Coastal Alabama Business Chamber won. They, as I said before, they won the Category 2 Chamber of the Year award. There are five categories last year based on chamber size and revenue with one winner in each category. As you probably know, the Chamber of the Year award is the top honor in the chamber industry. Um, and I'll say a few, a few words about the award and the process at the end of the webinar, but suffice to say it is an extremely competitive process. Today, Ed is going to tell you about one of the initiatives he described for us in his Chamber of the Year application. It's a rebranding initiative. But if you're interested in learning more about their second very innovative project in which the Chamber literally sank a ship off their coast to re-energize their tourism industry, you can find that synopsis on the ACC website. The Chamber of the Year judges described Ed as having contagious enthusiasm for his Chamber and his community. We're delighted to have him here this afternoon to describe his chamber's award-winning rebranding project and kick off our award winner series. With that, Ed, take it away. All right, thank you. Glad to be here, and uh, thank you for uh, asking us to share our enthusiasm with you about our rebranding project. Um, we uh, we uh, started this project uh, late with, as an idea late in 2012, and really took it on in earnest in 2013 and uh, we'll go over that whole process and what I thought we'd go over today is I wanted to go over just some real basic stuff on branding and what it is and what it isn't because a lot of people don't really have a mis well, they're, they're just not sure what branding is they 
they they um, they think certain things are branding that are not branding. And I want to quickly go over that, but then I want to jump right into what we did and all the different steps we did to rebrand and how we implemented it, and then also just maybe some. Some pointers, some some do's and don'ts that we've learned along the way. This is the third um, chamber that I've been the CEO, and we've done a rebranding at all three of them. Um, this one was the most comprehensive, I believe, and um, I've learned a lot along the way. So uh, basically, what we ended up doing is in this process, we went from being the Alabama Gulf Coast Area Chamber of Commerce. That's a mouthful, isn't it? And then we went from that to being the Coastal Alabama Business Chamber. And on the left side, you see what our old uh, graphic look was. It was, I don't know. I don't know what seagulls have to do with business advocacy or, uh, or right? it just wasn't us. And we all had that sort of hunch, and none of us really were happy with it. But we didn't, we didn't just go on hunches, as I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, and we went to a different name and a different complete look as well. And uh, we're now the Coastal Alabama Business Chamber. What is branding anyway? Well, a lot of people think branding is just, hey, let's get a new logo. And it is certainly not what branding is. Branding is not your name. It is not your slogan. Branding, a brand is not a product. A brand is not a service mark or a trademark. Um, rebranding is not holding a contest to pick your new logo. That's not rebranding. And, and rebranding is not just casually saying, hey, we need a new sign or we need a new logo. That is not what rebranding is. And we, we were very careful to make sure that that's not what we did. Um, branding is how your chamber is perceived. And that's how it's perceived by all the people who need to perceive it. That includes members. That includes non-members. For us, it includes people who live in the community who might use the chamber's services. It also includes for us visitors to the community because we're a big tourism destination. Branding is your promise to those people. It's your commitment to those people. And yes, while, while your name and your logo is part of your brand, it, your brand is really much, much more than that. And it really goes right down to including the look and feel of everything you publish, everything you print, how you look, how you behave how your staff acts and functions at member events, uh, how you answer the phone, what your email signature looks like, all of those things collectively become part of your organization's brand. Branding is the difference between bottle of soda and bottle of Coca-Cola. Branding is the difference between a, a mobile phone and an iPhone. That's, branding is the difference between you and them. And that's the important thing we wanted to, to get. At. Branding is what people know your chamber to be, what they want your chamber to be, and what they think your chamber is. Branding is something that we hope that you will approach as an ongoing strategy. It's not a one-time project. It does not have a completion date. It never ends. And um, it, it, it's sort of a, almost a way of life. Uh, to be constantly thinking about your brand, protecting your brand, defending your brand, and improving your brand. I guess most of us are familiar with some of the brands, if not possibly all of the brands on, on the screen here. Uh, they're, they're all national and international brands, very familiar. Many of them are familiar without even words. Uh, some of these brands are familiar just by their shape, or, uh, or if you take away the, the, the lettering, you can still, sometimes you can figure out what the brand is because it's so, it's, they're so commonplace and, and they're, so, they're, they're organizations that are very well branded. And that's what we want to talk about today. What is a, what is a well branded chamber and how do you, uh, how do you know your, your chamber is branded properly? Well branded organizations have a lot of things in common um, and these do too, but well branded organizations uh, they know that you have to find something to say about your brand, that you have to make that as simple and as focused as possible. And lastly, if you don't align your brand with your chamber's business strategy, you really don't have a brand. All right, that's the theory. Let's close the textbooks, and I know everybody wants to get down to what we did and, and how we did it, um, because that's 
what I get asked the most about. First, a little bit about us. We are a 1,000 member chamber. We have six full-time staff. Uh, when we're fully staffed, we're, we're down one right now. We will be hiring three new positions this year as a result of our uh, uh, capital campaign to, that we did for business development that raised a million and a half dollars. And so we will be hiring three, uh, three new professionals as well. Our population of our service area, it sort of depends on how you measure it and where you draw the lines. We're in a multi-city region, region and a multi-state region. Uh, our two major cities are Gulf Shores and Orange Beach, Alabama. We do have a number of members in, in surrounding cities. And uh, we also, uh, part of our service area is actually across the bridge um, in Perdido Key, Florida. Um, and uh, while they have a chamber in Perdido Key, uh, we have a, a lot of members and we've got five chambers in our own county, uh, but the Perdido Chamber is actually physically the closest one to our front door. So we have a great relationship with all five of them, all six of them, and uh, we're the largest of those chambers and tourism is our primary industry, no question about that. The next question is why did we decide, decide to rebrand in the first place? I think our chamber is probably a little different in its history than most of your chambers out there. We did not start as a chamber of commerce. We actually started out in the mid-1960s as a tourist association, not a chamber. We did not become a chamber until the 1980s. And I think that was part of the, the gap between our brand promise and who we had actually become I think that's probably what caused us to want to brand. When you're the new kid on the block, as we were in the '80s, um, you have some you have a little you have some challenges because you're in a situation where other people are defining you. We were being defined by others, and I don't just mean other chambers, other organizations, and other people. Uh, we were being defined as oh, you know, they're the tourism chamber, they're the festival chamber, they're the party chamber. Well, the fact is, is yeah, we we're, we're in a tourism community. And we do put on one of the largest festivals probably in the entire southeast, if not the country. Um, and we make no apologies that we do have good parties. But we're so much more than that, and we're a hardcore business association that's involved in, in some serious advocacy. And we decided that it was time to take control of our own brand. Uh, as you'll learn later, one of the reasons that we added the word business and called it a business chamber is we wanted to we wanted to just take control and prevent others from calling us as something other than a business chamber. And, and, and by just coming right out and saying it, what we're all about, that was a big part of it. And I'll explain that a little more in depth when we talk about research. Um, the bottom line on all of this is that we needed to reflect what we had actually become, not what we used to be. And one thing we kept telling everybody, the media and everybody during the launch was that we're not, we didn't just brand to become something that we're not. We have rebranded to catch up with what we had become over the years. Um, a party chamber does not have serious business programs like we do. A party chamber does not do hardcore advocacy like we do. A party chamber doesn't have 500 of its members and committees. Party Chamber doesn't raise one and a half million dollars for economic development. Uh, so we really needed to make sure our brand caught up with what we really, really were. It was time to get down to work and we acted on the hunch, as I mentioned before. This took place at our board retreat in 2012. And at our board retreat is where we, late 2012 in Destin, Florida, we decided we were going to research and develop a brand. And that was the goal, to research and develop a new chamber brand by the end of the year. And we took all of our steps from that one goal that we did at that one retreat. There were five basic steps in, in our branding process, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to touch on all five of them, and including the first two, which I think are the two that are most often overlooked in, by, by, many, by many organizations. There's the market research phase, there's the positioning phase, there's the graphic design phase, there's developing the communications, and the fifth one is brand launch implementation and performance. 
And the final is really not a phase. It's something you do forever. It's measurement and reinforcement. Um, and, and we'll talk about that as well. That's where we get into protecting and defending your brand and improving your brand. Uh, we had some leeway, but we were realistic enough to know that it was probably going to take a whole year to get this project done and that it would probably take another full year to implement it once the brand was launched. And, and, and we, were, we were certainly correct on that hunch. The first phase was the research phase. And this is where the people who say, let's have a contest and pick a new logo, uh, they're so far off what they need to be doing that they totally forget about the research phase, which is the most important because you might do research and find out you don't need to you don't need to rebrand and 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 so we took this very seriously and our research phase took about uh, it took a little longer than we thought I would say it probably took two and a half to three months the purpose of researching is to dig deep you want to be qualitative and quantitative and be patient it does take time to do your research and map out your audiences before you start we did a lot of not only planning the research, we publicized the research with little uh, cards like the one you see on the screen and, and Facebook postings and emails. We wanted everyone to know that we wanted input. We made that just as much a big of a deal as the research itself. And, uh, and we need you to help. We need your help. And this helps with the buy-in too, especially when your research ends up leading you to not only change your look, but to change your name. All of that all of that uh, input helps with the buy-in and it creates excitement. The first part of the research is quantitative, as much information as you can possibly get. We did electronic surveys of our members. We did uh, community location intercepts of, of residents because residents are a big part of why we're here. We don't, we're, not a, we're not a civic club, but part of serving our members is dealing with residents and helping to promote our members to our residents. Same thing with visitors. So we did special uh, intercept surveys at special events where we knew specifically we would be getting, we would be reaching out of town people who we, whose opinions we needed on what they perceive a chamber to be and what they don't perceive a chamber to be. So we really worked hard to reach all of our intended audiences in the quantitative research phase. Once we got all of that, and we learned an awful lot, as you'll see in a minute, but once we got into, the, we took that quantitative research and we started doing qualitative research. This is where you go really deep. You pull off all the layers of the onions. You do focus groups, small groups, peeling the paint sessions with staff. You want to really interrogate your brand. You really want to find out what people are thinking, and, and you can't do this with surveys. Surveys give you breadth. But focus groups and one-on-one -on -one gives you depth. So we we had separate focus groups for people who were who were members, for people who were not members. Uh, we had focus groups for residents who might use the chamber's services, and for visitors who might use the chamber's services. The research told us a lot. It told us an awful lot. First of all, one of the things that we learned is that we were being perceived differently by each group. People who were business people and they were chamber members, they were far more likely to get it. They were far more likely to know that our main purpose is a business advocacy organization. And our main reason for being here is to help business grow. But when we talk to residents and even businesses who were not members, their answers tended to be along the lines of, uh, yeah, you're the visitor center or you promote uh, the community. You do all the advertising. Well, the fact is, we don't do that. We have a separate Convention and Visitors Bureau that does that. So there was definitely a disconnect between what we did and what some of these groups think we did. Another reason that we ended up having business put into our name. We really wanted to make it clear. But what we found out is there was a lot of confusion among all demographics. Going into this, we thought that the older demographics would, would get it more, that they would understand more of what a chamber is and that maybe it was the younger ones that didn't. And what we found out was that increasingly it was all age groups that found a, a disconnect and, 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 and not just about our chamber. This was about chambers of commerce in general because we, when we asked them what is a chamber of commerce, we didn't say what is 
the Alabama Gulf Coast Chamber of Commerce. We asked the Chamber of Commerce. We wanted to get what are the first things that come to their minds, and, and we were shocked. We were absolutely shocked. The, uh, a lot of people said the word chamber sounds like city council chamber, county commission chamber. Someone, one of the people said it sounds like the name of a restaurant or it reminds them of decompression chambers. Uh, but there was so much of that from all different age groups. And, you know, when you have to go to a, a rotary club, which usually tends to be older folks and, or, or, a, or a college class, which tends to be younger folks, and you have to spend the first 10 minutes of your presentation telling people what you are, well, there's 10 minutes that you cannot use to tell them what you, what you do and why it's important. So we realized there was a problem there. We also, the word commerce had a real disconnect. People mentioned things like the State Department of Commerce, the U.S. Department of Commerce. Real funny one was that's where Leave It to Beaver's dad goes to meetings. And the banker on the Beverly Hillbillies, the Commerce Bank, and all that. We really had people associating first word impressions with things that were absolutely not what a Chamber of Commerce is. And it was a lot of folks, and it was using the generic word chamber, not just our chamber. We realized that the phrase Chamber of Commerce in our research, the data said that it, people think it sounds stodgy, old fashioned, buddy duddy, pretentious, irrelevant. It sounds like people that don't have computers or social media. Uh, it sounds like the place you go where there's a bunch of dead people's pictures of all the people that were chairman in the 1920s, clicks, closed doors, old fashioned. We got a lot of that when we dug deep and did some serious research. And, uh, and of course, we all know that's not what we are. Um, this is not us, but this is what people thought, told us they thought chambers were. Old fashioned, Mad Men era or earlier. It just, it just didn't, this is us. This is us. And you know, everything you see on there, it looks like fun and whimsical, but uh, the, the, the bottom left, that's a speed networking event. The bottom right, that's a, that's a business after hours. The top left with the helicopter, that's a ribbon cutting. And we are different. We are edgy. We are not this at all. And in spite of, in spite of that we are a fun and, 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 uh, and, and happy place and in somewhat ways laid back, we're hardcore business. We do seminars. We do, we do uh, economic development summits. We do research. We do a lot of things, and, and there was just a disconnect between that and party chamber as well. So we, we realized we were in somewhat of a bind, and that's where all of that data we collected, all of that research took us to phase two, and that's the positioning phase. And the positioning phase is, is the second most commonly overlooked, maybe it probably is even more commonly overlooked than the rest, because it's not really an exciting Thing like designing new artwork and coming up with new names and all of that. But basically the positioning is where you learn. This is where you take the research and you do something with it. This is where you actually take the research and crunch it and dive even further and you get your marketing people that are involved on your branding committee or some the key people that are at the core of this effort. Take a good look at that research and they put together what's called a branding wheel. Now I know this, it looks hokey and real textbooky and marketing 101-ish, but it's critical. It's very critical and you can't ignore it. And a brand wheel is when you take the research, and this is a sample brand wheel because each person involved had to create one. And first, the first thing we did is we, we, we actually had them come up with the attributes of the chamber. What are the attributes of us? What are we? And this is what you're looking at is a sample from one person. This is this is just a sample. I said membership organization, focused but personal, open and inclusive, all about business. What are the benefits of our brand? And this you're basically in our brand chairman Gary Gilpin, um, who is a former advertising agency owner in in Orlando and Atlanta, you know, he he likes to say that that this is the phase where you interrogate the brand until it gives up its strength. And this process can take several weeks of doing it and several meetings before you really crystallize and come up with the, the, the thing that's in the center, which is called your brand essence. 
Um, along the way in this process, you want to learn if your if your um, if your brand has a personality, who would it be? If your brand was a movie star, who would it be? If your brand had values, what are they? And and along the way, you develop a really keen understanding of what your brand is, and you have got to do this before you get into the creative phase. If you don't do this, then you're wasting your time in the creative phase because you're you're not you're not really knowing what you're creating, and you need to know what you're creating before you create it. When you get into the creative phase, you want to of course design graphics. Your graphic must reflect your brand. It must state who you are and what you are. And by the way, for Chambers, your graphic, your look should, it should include where you are. And you'd be surprised how many Chambers of Commerce, uh, you go to their website and you don't even know what state they're in because it's not on their website. A lot of local newspaper websites, you've got to dig three or four pages before you find out what state that newspaper is in. So be very careful that your brand also includes where you are. And, um, and, and remember that logo development is a building process. Well, this is where we hit a roadblock. We were not ready to design graphics. We had to put this whole thing on hold because our research told us that there was several things severely wrong with our name. And until we got that fixed, we couldn't move any further. When we looked at our name, you know, all the research pointed to the need to change that name, and we didn't take that lightly. Um, we knew that we had a terrific artist, and we knew that whatever we came up with, we knew we were going to get something good out of that. So we took our time dealing with our name. The name had many problems. First of all, our old name was way too long, way too many syllables, and it was redundant. Alabama Gulf Coast area, well, the Alabama Gulf Coast is an area. You don't need to say it's an area. If you were saying Gulf Shores or Orange or City and then adding area by it, that's one thing. Because you're designating that it's the area of a city and its area. But we were redundant and we knew we needed to get rid of that. The words of commerce were still causing a big problem for us. There's such a disconnect. And, you know, I've been to some of these seminars where people tell you that it's uh, the Chamber of Commerce is. 20th or 10th most recognizable brand in the world. That may be. It may be recognizable, but that doesn't mean that people think uh, what they need to think about those words. And we realized our geographic identifier needs more focus, too. Um, we, we played around a lot with uh, how are we going to portray Alabama Gulf Coast, coastal Alabama, Gulf Coast. We weren't really sure, and we knew that that needed some work. The considerations, we really wanted to get rid of Chamber of Commerce entirely, and many chambers have. We were not ready to do that because we still had a strategic reason to keep the word Chamber. We did not want to give anyone or any other organization any reason to say that there's no Chamber in Gulf Shores or Orange Beach. So we kept the word Chamber. But what we did do is we added the word business. And that gave us a very clear, modern, understandable focus on our mission. Of commerce, that can mean, that can mean Department of Commerce. But you know what? Everybody knows what business is. We got rid of the word area. And then finally, we did a lot of research to figure out what the geographic part of our name needs to be. And the fact is, is what makes us unique is not that we're in Alabama. It's that we're on the coast. In fact, we're the only beach in Alabama. And so let's, let's make that the first part of our name. In Gulf, well, you know, that's kind of redundant to coast. So coast was what really stood out for us. And we made it coastal Alabama. We, we thought about Alabama coastal, but we ended up not doing that. So we took a lot of considerations and, and a lot of internal debate and finally came up with what we thought was the perfect name for us. At that point, we're ready to build a logo. Well, the name builds your logo once you have that. And you may go through rebranding and not need a new name, but we did. And so we had to take that little detour I just told you about. We started out with Coastal Alabama Business Chamber, and then we added a uh, 
we had probably a hundred different graphics to choose from that were this is the one that the people in our core group really liked the best and we felt that even though we're a business chamber we still want to keep a fun colorful look this is a very fun colorful community there's bright colors everywhere you go buildings are painted in bright colors uh, on the beach uh, it's it, we wanted to keep that look to it uh, but we still wanted it to be business like and that was the goal here we wanted the sun, the forward arrow for progress, and, and, and have a corporate looking logo that was maybe a tad bit whimsical, a tad bit fun, and very colorful, and that's how we ended up with what we think worked best for us. But along the way, we, we realized something. Take a good hard look at the I in the word business. Well, the, the bright young lady, Tara McMeans, who designed this logo, at 3 o'clock in the morning, it occurred to her that the I in business and the AM in chamber said I am and we could probably do something with it and maybe even have a little fun with it and so she showed us how you can like toggle it on and off and we do now our logo is the one on the left that's our standard logo but we have the I am at our disposal that we can turn on and on, off like a light switch for different occasions and different purposes. So when we're printing our legislative agenda, it's I am the voice of business. When we're doing something with our Young Entrepreneurs Academy, we are I am the voice of education. Our new decals next year, this year, are going to say I am a member of Chamber of the Year. I am a part of something big. And then uh, we have a, a, some co-branding, our one and a half million dollar uh, capital campaign was called Advantage Coastal Alabama. We use some of the same graphic elements as you can see for that as well. And our name badges say I am and then you write the name underneath. So I am John, I am Sally, I am so forth. So we have a lot of fun with that. Um, we, can, we can use it when we need to and, and, and shut it off when we, when we don't need it. And, and we're, real, we're kind of proud of that too. The, the, the next phase was the launch and implementation phase. How do we actually launch the brand? How do we get it out there? Well, we, 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 it took a little bit of planning. The first thing we had to plan a big launch event. We have a breakfast that we do every first Friday morning at a restaurant called Lulu's. That's owned by Lucy Buffett. She, her brother is Jimmy Buffett and she's a wonderful chamber member and a good friend of ours. And so we just use that occasion because a normal attendance is about 200 people at that breakfast every month. We had a bunch of people from uh, the community, from different aspects of the life, dress up with I am on their t-shirts that we had for them so that when we unveiled the brand and undraped it, um, we had a fun little thing where they all out of the blue stood up and said, I am this and I am that. And we have a video that we'll point you to that you can see how that went. It was really a lot of fun. But we publicized this in advance. We had specialty items, lapel pins, all kind of cool stuff printed up with the Chamber logo, ready to give everybody at that branding event. And it was, it was an exciting morning. And actually, all of our breakfasts are, are like that. All of our breakfasts have that real tropical, fun feel to them. And so we felt that that was the, the, best, uh, the best place to do it. We, we had a video news release. Um, you'll be able to click and, 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 and see this. It's on our YouTube channel. But we had a video news release that was prepared uh, and distributed an embargo to the media the night before uh, explaining what we did and why we did it. We had a post video event. In fact, one of the young people you saw wearing those t-shirts is a student from our Entrepreneur Academy uh, who his business is a video business and he created a very cool uh, special effects studded video of the actual event that morning. And uh, you'll be able to see that as well uh, on, our, on our page, and you'll get the link for that. It, the, the video really captured the fun of our chamber and the seriousness of our mission as well. That was a delicate balance we've had to do. We're not the party chamber, but we're not a bunch of fuddy duds, but yet we are a business. That, that whole theme ran through the whole, the whole process, that whole year of developing the brand. Uh, we got a new website. Uh, we got a new domain. Uh, uh, um, and, and, and in the top left, you see a little piece of our old one. But, uh, you know, we made it real colorful to match the brand and, and to match the excitement. Uh, a new 
uh, vehicle wrap, and that that really draws a lot of attention all over the island. And we take it to ribbon cuttings, and the chamber mobile is the chamber mobile is seen everywhere. It's it's a lot of fun. Uh, new signage. Uh, we share a building. We own the building, but the CVB rents from us until next month. They're going to be moving out for their own building so that we can take it all over with our new staff. But um, the the sign guy took took their sign down by mistake, and he was putting. We caught him in this photo. But the cool thing is, that you get to see both of our logos in one place. There, that's probably the only time you'll ever see that. But we stopped him right there. Told him to put the CVB one back up on the left and put our new one up on the right and uh, so this was actually being done during the breakfast while we were unveiling um, the other the logo at breakfast the sign people were actually putting this out on the highway we have 60,000 cars a day that see this sign and and it was done at that at that moment um, we got a lot of media coverage locally and regionally we were real pleased with that I guess who isn't pleased with media coverage it's used unless it's really bad and it wasn't. It was very good. And um, and what we learned is that the implementation phase only began that day. And the implementation page took a, phase took a whole year or more. You've got to be patient. Um, there are websites to fix, social media, apps, icons, printed materials, signage, vehicles. Think of all the things you need to do to change your brand. It's not going to happen overnight especially when you have a small window between brand development and when you want to launch it. You've got to, you've got to really map everything out and do the important things first and make sure that certain things are in place the day of and, and, and then go from there. Also, we had to develop a brand standards manual. Every brand should have a standards manual. These are a few sample pages from it, but the manual, the manual actually regulates how our brand is used. So when we get something printed or if we're getting coffee mugs with the chamber logo or, or something, you know, this has all the specs, all the right colors, all the right ways to use it. Uh, how to use it if it's one color, how to use it if you're going to turn on the IM or not. So we, we, we made sure that we have these rules because if you don't have the rules, you can't enforce them. We don't want people using different typefaces and putting them on background colors we don't like and all of that stuff. So have a brand standards manual, a very important thing to do. And finally, this is the phase. It's not really the, it's the after phase. It's the five plus phase. This is what goes on forever. And, and, and you have to constantly be monitoring your brand. And we monitored it with surveys uh, a year later with the entire membership to learn what people thought of our brand. And we were very successful. Uh, after only one year, over 80% of the members agreed that the new name accurately reflects the mission and work of the chamber. Over 86% represents. Now, keep in mind, we had probably grown by 12% during the year. So a lot of the people that maybe didn't agree, they didn't know the old brand or they never saw the old brand. So we viewed this as a very, very um, strong validation that we were on the right path in developing our brand. If, if, if we're going to be doing this every year. This isn't something you just do once and forget about. Uh, I, I dare say if over the past 30 years they had done some brand evaluations, they probably wouldn't have taken as long to change the brand as they did. And I want to finally give, give you a few tips and pointers. These are some things we learned along the way. You don't need a paid branding company. When I was in another chamber, uh, we had a company that came to us and uh, they wanted seventy thousand dollars, and that was just to research. That was just to research and develop the brand, not even implement it. And uh, we just didn't want to spend that kind of money. And in that chamber, we actually had the resources of a of a nearby college that had a wonderful MBA program, and uh, and they they did it for us. They actually took that project on uh, in, in in a very professional way similar to what we've done here. Um, just because you don't hire a company, don't try to do it all yourself. Don't try to make this just something you, you do yourself or you give to your communications director. It's just not going to be successful if you do that. Do be resourceful. Use local experts. Um, Gary Gilpin is a retired ad agency owner, 
and I say he's retired, he's retired from that business. He, he has a real estate company now. But he took this on as a as a, as our chairman for the branding and, and having his expertise was just worth its weight in gold. Don't rush, don't skip the research and positioning phases. I know they're not very exciting, but you're not really going to know what you don't know unless you unless you do those. Don't hold a contest to pick a logo or a name. This is this is serious business. Um, you're, you you don't want to be at the whim of somebody trying to win a contest. That's just ridiculous. Don't be patient. I mean, do be patient in all phases, especially the implementation, because it's going to take some time to get everything switched over. Make sure you evaluate one year later. Um, do all your legal homework. Make sure you protect your intellectual property if you're coming up with anything new. And if it involves a name change, make sure you, you get your legal counsel to follow all legal and state and federal laws pertaining to your name change. Depending on where you're located, you might be told that it's better to do a doing business as and keep your original name or some you might be told you need to change your bylaws or make sure you're doing whatever you legally need to do for where you are. Also, if you're going to go get some new domain names because of a new name, go out and buy them quietly even before you approve the new name. Just buy if you're if you're thinking of two or three names, go out and buy domain names for two or three new names. They're really cheap. And what you don't use, you just throw it back and don't renew it a year later. But buy them, buy a lot of them, buy the different versions, .com, .org, .net, all of them, um, and do them quietly. And don't let, just don't, don't let people know. Do, the, minute, the minute you start talking about potential names, go buy your names. Because what you're going to find out, <clears throat> someone will go out there and buy the name and squat on it, and they'll come back and try to sell it to you for ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 or more when you could have just paid 10 bucks to go daddy. So make sure you do that quietly and quickly. Um, also, do not have your board get involved in the creative process. If they're board members, if they want to be on the committee, that's fine. That's the place to do it. If they, if they you know, everybody wants to be an expert, uh, your chairman should appoint a committee with a trusted chairman and have faith in their work. Trust the process. Make sure your chairman updates the board continually and continuously. What you don't want is a bunch of meetings where the board is wasting time debating on, I like this shade of blue and I don't like that font, and maybe you should put Alabama before coastal or coastal Alabama. Trust the process, keep them informed all the way, uh, but this is, not, this is not for them to debate and decide. This is the committee's job, and if they want to vote, vote it down, that's fine. But trust the process, and you'll be a lot happier if you do it that way. Um, take advantage of your staff. Get your staff involved. We believe we have the best chamber staff in the entire world or the entire universe, and uh, we're very proud of them. Um, we feel that they are a big part of why we're successful, and we think that our brand is going to be a big part in the coming years of why we keep being successful. So that's all I have, and if anybody has questions, would love to answer them. All right. Thank you, Ed. That was a terrific presentation, and there was lots of good information and details. Um, just to remind everybody that um, Ed will send me his presentation itself so you can download it um, right where you can view the recording of the presentation. So um, if you have any questions, you can go ahead and type them in the question box, um, and uh, I will read them to Ed. And while we're waiting to see if we have any questions, um, just um, a few notes about this year's Chamber of the Year um, process. It's um, uh, the 2016 process has just started. And the, first, the very first deadline for any chamber wishing to apply this year is to complete ACCE's Dynamic Chamber Benchmarking Survey um, by February 26th. Um, and you can check um, to see more details about this requirement and the entire process on our website um, at www.acce.org slash COY. Or just go to our homepage and follow the links to Chamber of the Year. Um, there's also a recorded webinar on the Chamber of the Year process on the, on the um, ACCE webinar page where you will find this uh, webinar as well. So I don't
see any questions right now. Um, Ed, did you have anything else? Do you want to get, say a few minutes on your Sink the Ship um, project sure. before well, we, we have, uh, close it down? <laughs> yeah, that, that, was, uh, that was probably even a more exciting project. We are located on the Gulf Coast, about halfway between New Orleans, Louisiana, and Panama City Beach, Florida, or about halfway between Mobile and Pensacola. And um, here on the Gulf, we do not have natural reefs the way, for example, South Florida has. And so we've never re really been a big diving capital here on, on the Gulf Coast. Well, about three years ago, in my monthly meeting with our CVB, my counterpart at the CVB, we have a breakfast um, with the two chairs and the two presidents once a month, and we just, just update each other and bad ideas around. And we're just sitting there having breakfast, and uh, the chairman of the CVB, who's a past chair of our chamber twice, uh, says, brings up this idea, you know, we really need to develop our diving industry. We need to, we need to be a diving capital. And, uh, how do you do that without artificial, without without natural reefs? Well, you got to have artificial reefs. Well, we happen to have a company in Orange Beach that builds reefs, and uh, they're based here, and they build reefs all over the world. Um, and you know, they build reefs. They're artificial things. They're made of concrete. They're different structures. You may, if you're a diver, you may have seen them—the pyramid-shaped ones or square-shaped ones, and so forth. But we realized it needed to be something bigger than, than that. We we had to have a we had to have a rock star of a reef if we wanted to get on the map for people to take notice. So we uh, with his help, the, the owner of that company, we located a 280 foot retired cargo ship, and this cargo ship was uh, had been taken out of service. It was it was just sitting at the Miami River down in Miami, Florida. And uh, it was for sale. And we wanted to price how much would it cost to purchase it, to transport it up here to the Gulf, to clean and dehazmat it, make it environmentally sound, and then to take it out to the Gulf and sink it. What is the price tag for that? The normal price tag for that is about a million dollars, which is what this company will charge most out of town communities and counties and cities that want to do this and uh, but he wanted to do something in his hometown here and he said he could do it for for five hundred thousand dollars so um, this this gentleman who was the past chair said you know I'll get involved but I, I'm not going to lead this thing you know he he's retired he had just sold his business to Wyndham and he really didn't want to take it on as his project so two days later, we brought it to the board. The board got fired up about it. One gentleman on our board said, I'll share it. And before you know it, we had a reef maker task force. And we set out to raise money. Well, along the way, we realized it would be a lot easier if we set up a 501c3 foundation so that the donations could be tax deductible. We had already done that 10 years ago with an education foundation. So that was easy to do. And we set up a foundation in record time um, we met our goal of 500,000 and exceeded it by another 350,000 in less than two and a half months. And uh, so we had the money to pay for our new reef by the end of 2012. By at, at our December just at Lulu's, we announced it that we had we had raised the money. The largest private donor was Lucy Buffett's business partner. And um, and he wanted to name it in her honor. So the name of our reef ship is the Lulu. And we brought it up from Miami, and they started working on it, had to pick a good date, had to get clearance with the state, had to make sure it was environmentally sound. Long story short, on Memorial Day of 2013, we had us a reef, sink, reef ship sinking party. The whole weekend, first we brought the boat down to Lulu's on Friday for a christening, and Lucy got to christen the the renamed boat, and it was there at her restaurant all day Saturday, and on Sunday we we took it 17 miles offshore, due south of Orange Beach, with over 300 boats watching, 
and the ship sunk in about a 20 minute period and it sunk almost perfectly upright. Within 24 hours there were already divers. Within two weeks there was plant and marine life congregating and building up around the ship. And 10 months later National Geographic magazine put us on a list of the top 15 nature travel destinations to see before you die, all for a project that didn't even exist a year earlier. So we were real proud of, of the fact that our chamber was able to do something that um, we don't know of any anyone else who's been able to raise half a million dollars to purchase a tourist attraction and sink it. Um, we were so excited that our chairman that year set a goal and the goal was we're going to do three reef projects in three years with the Lulu being the first. The second year, which was 2014, we built a we built the first underwater playground called Poseidon's Playground and we built that one closer into shore for more novice divers. We knew that the, the Lulu had to be a big name to get a lot of international attention but we did, need, we did need something for novice and younger divers, so Poseidon's Playground is out there. And we even built an underwater wedding altar because we are also a wedding destination. So a wedding altar is part of Poseidon's Playground. And then just last year, the third of the three years, we found and located a 180-foot barge. And the barge is about nine miles out, sort of halfway out between the Poseidon's Playground and the Lulu. And we are now a major diving destination. We're estimating that the diving industry um, is generating, has generated since Memorial Day of 13, uh, we estimate the diving industry has generated about $45 million for our community. And it's only going to go up from there. But we're really excited about it. If anybody wants to see a cool video of that ship sinking, go to YouTube. And, and type in sinking of the Lulu. There's a bunch of videos, but take a look at the aerial one. It will blow your mind. All right. Well, thanks, Ed, for um, giving us that little description of the uh, of your sinking ship project. It's a fascinating um, study, and congratulations on that. Um, I have a few questions on your branding initiative. Um, sure. If and I can go ahead with those. Um, the first one is that he. Uh, this person would like to know a little bit more about how to approach a university or MBA program um, to help with the, the projects question. as you have suggested. Do you Great have some question. tips that you can uh, share? The, well, at the chamber I was at uh, where we did that, um, uh, we were blessed in that they contacted us. But um, that notwithstanding, um, if, if you have a a university that you have a relationship with and hopefully if you're a chamber you have good relationships with all of your universities and colleges. Uh, I would approach whoever is the head of the business department and in our case it was it was a professor. It was two professors who initially approached us um, and, and expressed an interest in this and, and at first we were a little bit reluctant because you know sometimes when you get student projects you're getting somebody trying to rush something by the end of the semester and, and that's something you absolutely don't want by the way you want this to be but but we were we were told this was going to work a little differently and it did this was a multi-class multi-semester project in which all phases including research were supervised by the two professors and the, it's the professors who sort of served as the account executives so we got some really, really high quality work and we didn't need to worry about, well, end of the semester, they're rushing to turn in a bunch of garbage that's not finished just to get their grade. Um, the professors would actually, you know, hold stuff over and sometimes there were things that multiple classes were working on and sometimes the students were in more than one class and, and they had both graduate and undergraduate students. So we just got an incredible value for nothing. I mean, we got our money's worth because it didn't cost anything. The only downside, and, and really it wasn't a big deal because these things take time anyway, is we had to work around the, 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 the academic calendar. Um, in between semesters and things like that, there was downtime and we just had to, you know, it took a little longer than we had thought, but it wasn't anything, it wasn't anything that, that was negative at all. And um, the, the one thing we learned in that process was uh, when we got to the creative phase, 
we kind of felt like we were hitting a dry well because these 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 were marketing students and business students and they weren't artists. So a beautiful thing happened at that point, and we got another college at the university involved. We got the communication students who were in graphics, graphic arts, and got them involved. And we got some really, really good ideas that way. So talk about making it multi-class, multi-semester. This was now multidisciplinary. And, and we ended up with a really good brand. And it did involve a name change as well. So use your resources. If you have colleges and universities, uh, we didn't go that route here because we had a great expert with Gary Gilpin. And, and, and he was able to do things for us that, that I know would have cost tens and tens of thousands of dollars in consulting fees. But, but everybody has some resources. You just need to go find who they are. Okay. Um, we had some questions on your survey. Um, are you willing yep. to share any of your survey questions, including some of the questions you used to begin the focus group sessions? Sure. I'll be glad to share anything. And, um, actually, you can send them to me and I can post them or I can send them to the folks asking the question either way. Okay. It, might so we'll a while around, them. it might take me a while to round some of those up, but we'll get them. Yeah, no. Okay. We'll get it done. Um, then uh, what was the total cost of the rebranding from start to finish? And did it's you have any trade-outs or recommendations yep. to reduce costs other than okay, the yep. MBA? I, do. I, I absolutely do. Um, and, 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 and how much it costs us depends on how we look at it. And the reason I'm saying that is not to be evasive. It's because we were fortunate that we had some grant monies. We're really good at going out and finding grants that we need for things. And, and we had some monies from a grant that we got. We were able to use some of those funds for some of the, the costs of the brand branding. Most of the costs for us were in, in implementation because we didn't have any very limited research and development costs because the, the marketing research was pretty much done pro bono with Gary Gilpin and our great volunteers. Uh, yeah, we had some minor printing costs and, you know, the survey monkey we already have. And a lot of these things are things that we already had in our resources. So we didn't really need to count it as part of a branding budget per se. Um, a lot of the branding costs were hardcore hardware things that we did because it involved a name change and because we knew we, need, we needed to fix things around here anyway. The new sign, the digital sign. The digital sign was paid for by a grant for the digital sign. We just happened to take advantage of it to also make it our new sign. Um, the, a lot of the printing and things that you do, keep in mind a lot of your branding expenses are for recurring perishable things that you need to replenish every year anyway. So plan ahead. It doesn't necessarily have to be part of your branding budget. You're going to get a new brand. Well, guess what? Next year you're going to need new decals, aren't you? Just plan ahead. Um, a lot of things you can get by with finishing up what you currently have and replacing it. Um, but um, you know, you may find a lot pro bono. Our, our artwork was pro bono. Of course, our production costs were not. We did have to pay for those things. Um, but we found the money in our budget to to do what what we needed to do. And um, and I think I think we probably in in total costs. And again, this this includes you know new website, new a uh, bunch of stuff. Probably thirty thousand dollars tops. All right. Um, uh, and again, a lot of that a lot of those costs are things we would have done anyway, had we not had a new brand. So. That's why it's hard to give you an exact figure. Right. Um, you mentioned a, a capital campaign that raised $1.5 million. Can you yeah. share any details relating to that? Absolutely. Um, we have been uh, on, a, on a trajectory here for the last um, several years with, with our leadership wanting to take a more aggressive role in business development, economic development. and. Um, we decided that even though there's a countywide economic development alliance that we're actually a part of and we actually invest in, we needed to, our county's very, very big. To drive from Orange Beach, the south end of the county, all the way to the north end, it's about an hour and a half. Um, to go to our county commission meeting, it's over an hour drive to the county seat. We're big and spread out, and we're very different from the rest of the county. In the north part of the county, there's a lot of open land for 
for um, industrial parks and things like that. And here, here on the on the south part, we're an island. We're a barrier island. Uh, we have different needs for new and existing businesses, and we felt that it was time for us again. This is all part of taking our own future in our own hands um, to to invest some money and be able to hire people who work on things we need here. We still support what they're doing, and they support what we're doing. But um, quite frankly, we don't want an industrial park on the beach, and we don't want heavy manufacturing on our island. And and there's things that we need that are different from the rest of the county. And so um, we decided to form a to put together a five-year strategic plan for what we were going to do. Um, we went we brought in probably over 130 different leaders from throughout the community over a four month period, five month period, and uh, we wanted to get, we wanted to find out what the needs were for uh, for them. What are the things, what are the obstacles between them and future success? And out of that came a five point strategic plan um, based on existing industry development, new business, um, environment and conservation, transportation and infrastructure, and education. And we set some very specific goals and projects together of things we were going to do over a five-year period. Um, and then we did a feasibility study. We went out and interviewed uh, 70 different key possible investors and showed them these goals and said, are we barking up the wrong tree or not? Is this something we, we need in our community or not? And that feasibility, and by the way, we said, if we were to do this, is this a role for the chamber or not? And if it is, would you be willing to fund it or not? And as a result of that, we found out that yes, 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 and yes. And, uh, and so we then took the final phase and last year started a capital campaign. We really didn't get our first investment till about March. We really didn't get going in earnest with the investments until, uh, until I'd say maybe June. And, and we, just got to the $1.5 million mark, something that's never been done in a, here in this community that we know of. And that's going to give our chamber uh, $300,000 a year for the next five years to implement this plan. We are in the process right now of hiring a director of business development. Um, we have our finalists coming in for interviews starting next week. We're going to be hiring a director of communications and a database manager. So we'll have three new, uh, three new people added to our staff. And the timing couldn't be perfect because our, our good friends and tenants at the Convention Visitors Bureau are building their own building just about 200 yards north of here. And the third of our building that they rent from us will be put to very, very good use. Okay. Um, I know we're just at uh, 3 o'clock now, but there's one final question on your logo, if you have a moment. Um, this question said, her chamber uses different logos for each of their different signature events, like a Washington Update, Business After Hours, and so on. Um, how did you negotiate moving away from using all those individual logos to just using the new chamber logo? Was there any pushback on that? Um, I'm not sure we really, I mean, we have a shrimp festival and it has a logo. We didn't get away from using it. Um, that has its own brand and its own very exciting brand. We have our Coastal Christmas Initiative. We didn't touch that brand, but those are projects. Those are projects of the chamber. They're not competing organizations, and we just incorporate things. We we if we're publishing a a, a, a brochure about our shrimp festival, um, it's going to have the shrimp festival logo on there, along with uh, Zatarin's, which is our corporate sponsor, and any other sponsors and and somewhere on there it will have the chamber logo because we produced it um, but no we didn't move away from using those things um, there's nothing wrong with uh, there's nothing wrong with doing some kind of a coke branding kind of thing where you modify your logo and use modifications of it for some of your projects and a lot of chambers do that in fact uh, we did that for Advantage Coastal Alabama, which I think it was on one of the slides, where a modified version of some of the graphic elements of our new logo were used for Advantage Coastal Alabama. And and if you go to the website we created for that project is myonecoast.com, you'll see that it uses that logo. 
Okay. Well, thank you, Ed, for that um, great presentation. Lots of details, lots of tips, um, information I know we all can use. And thank you all for your participation and your questions. Um, remember that the webinar was recorded, and I'll post the recording and Ed's presentation. Um, look for it in 24, 48 hours or so on the ACC website. And uh, if you want to speak directly to Ed, he has his contact information um, on the slide in front of you. So again, thanks everyone, thanks Ed, and have a wonderful afternoon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.